Hey gang, so let's do a quick tutorial just over our calculator, just on some different things. So just a reminder, when you um, sit down for your exam, you want to be sure and check your mode. And for my applications, you want to remember to make sure you are in degrees. So you'll highlight degrees, you'll hit enter. And everybody wants to go down to their stack diagnostic and make sure it's turned on. The reason we do that is so that whenever we do our linear regressions for our Pearson's product moment correlation, which whenever we're doing those regressions, remember we use our stat button and we calculate and we do a linear regression. Remember MX plus B. We go down to linear regressions number four. In order to see the regression line, the R value, you have to have the stat diagnostic turn on. I'll do one of those here in just a second. I don't think I have anything in my stat. Oh, I do. Okay, here we go. When you go to calculate a linear regression number four and you hit enter all the way through, in order to see the R value, you have to have something. You have to have your, your mode turned on. You have to have the diagnostic turned on. Okay. All right, so you've turned that on and you're like, okay, I'm ready to rock and roll. So another button that you'll use a lot when you're doing a linear regression. So if you're doing Pearson or Spearman. So some of you are asking today about Pearson and Spearman. So Pearson and Spearman are both the same button. You hit the stat and you put everything in edit. That's the only one we ever used. You put everything in line one or L1 and L2. Then you hit stat again, calculate. For the regression lines, we use number four. If we're doing a quadratic regression, we do five. Then if we're doing an exponential regression, we used zero. Really, those were the main ones that we used. Then for the regression, whether it's Spearman or whether it is just a straight up line, linear regression, we use this. Now, my analysis, guys, whenever we were doing our y on x, but sometimes we did x on y. All you need to remember is that if you're doing x on y, you just need to swap your L1 and L2. Normally we do y on x. This is y on x. If you're doing x on y, you simply swap your L1 and your L2. That's all you need to do there. All right, Spearman, going back here, stat, calculate. Number four, it's the same thing. Just calculate it, Spearman, R, all we do is we put a little sub S down there, R sub S, that's going to be Spearman. Okay, so that's your linear regressions. We never use R squared. We always just use R. So we're not going to use R squared. We're just, just going to use R. Okay, um, another one that we did typically was in our test. We did all the other things here. Oh, you know what? Let me go back to um, when you had a, um, a T test, or not a T test, when you had one variable statistics versus two variables. One variable is when they just give you one set of data and you just need to find out some quick information about it. Most of the time is when I just needed to average everything together really fast and you could add everything up. Like let's say they gave us 10 values and I needed to find the average. If you do stat calculate one variable statistics, it gives you information really quick. It adds up and takes the average. Remember, X bar is the average X. If they gave me two sets of data, stat, calculate two sets of data, two variable statistics, then it would give me the average X and the average Y. So the two variable statistics, it was just a real fast way to get a lot of information. Now, along those same lines, if I'm doing box and whisker plots, this one variable statistics, it also gives me Q1, oh, and Q3. Real quick, Q1 and Q3. Now remember, when you're finding Q1 and Q3, remember that's where you do a box and whisker and you line all your information up. You take the middle. It's like if you have all this data and you line everybody up and you take the middle person. And then Q1 is where you take all the data and you take the person in the middle on the left-hand side. That's Q1. And then you take all the people on the right hand side and you take the person in the middle, that's Q3. The IQR is the interquartile range from Q1 to Q3. How many people are there here? That's, and remember, it divides it up 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. It divides everybody up. Your calculator on one variable statistic gives you the minimum value. 
the Q1, the middle, and Q3, and the maximum. Remember, I did that by going stat, calculate one variable statistic. Where did it get this information? It did it because it took my L1 column. Now, I did not tell it to use L2. I just happen to have this information in here. It takes it from L1. Now, if you look at one variable statistic, it's L1. Then it says frequency list. Usually we don't have something in for a one variable statistic. We don't have the frequency of it in there. Now, I know on that projected test that I gave you all today, none of that had a cumulative frequency. We have had a cumulative frequency on every test. So if you're watching this tonight, I think tomorrow in class we will definitely review a cumulative frequency. The Revision Village did not predict that that was going to be on paper one. I feel like we should definitely review that tomorrow because they could toss that out there and, you know, put that on the test. So anyway, all right. Um, so that was variable statistics. Okay, let's go to apps. Finance. Remember finance. If you have a financial problem, you're going to hit apps. Enter finance. Enter TMV solver. And you're going to do all your buttons here. Remember, N was the number of years. Usually it's like 10 years you're going to invest this money. And then you're going to multiply that by how many times a year are you going to get that money compounded? Are you going to do it monthly? Are you going to do it quarterly? Are you going to do it twice a year, semi-annually? You know, what's it going to do? And usually it's monthly, so you'll do like times 12. They'll tell you the interest rate is maybe like 2.3%. How much are you investing? Maybe I'm investing $5,000. Am I making payments? Is it an annuity? Am I paying off a credit card? Am I paying off a house? You know, in this situation, I'm not. I'm just investing some money. And maybe I want to know how much money, what's the future value of what I'm doing? I'm going to be making 12 payments every year. So I put in 12, or sorry, I'm getting, making 12 payments uh, a year. So what's the future value? How much am I going to end up having? at 2.3 um, interest, like the bank's going to pay me interest of 2.3% every month. That's actually a really high interest. So I do alpha, the green button, alpha, and then come down here at the bottom and I hit solve. And then it tells me I'm going to have $6,291 after 120 payments. Not very much, but anyway, that's how much money I'm going to have. Remember with financial math, one positive, one negative. You put the money in, when you take it out of the bank, it's negative. It can go either way. This can be negative, this can be positive, this can be positive, this can be negative. It, it doesn't matter. Whichever way, you, just remember if you get an error, one's got to be positive, one's got to be negative. It doesn't matter which one. Usually we do it at the end. We don't do the payment at the beginning. But it, again, it doesn't matter really on this, but we typically put it at the end. All right. On the apps, we're going to go down to... Um, if we're solving equations, we can go down to poly, um, what was this one? Poly, uh, was that one? Yeah, that's what I want. The poly, okay, let me go back to that again. I didn't say that right. Number nine. It's number nine on these. Poly systematic solver or something like that. I can't remember how we said it. Number nine was what we always called it. Poly root finder and the uh, simultaneous equation solver. Poly root finder, that was where you could solve equations. Uh, all kinds of degrees on here, y'all. I'll do the third degree, so I'm going to do enter on the third degree. I say next, and it gives me a cubic up here. And then I fill that in, and then I can solve it. So I'll put like the six here. I'll say maybe this is negative three, and then I'll say this is eight, and then maybe this is one. And then I come up here, and I say solve, and it tells me that the only solution here is that x is negative 0.11, whatever. So that's my solve there. Okay, the simultaneous equation solver, I'll say that I have uh, three equations. And I'm going to say that I have three unknowns. And it sets it up, and you can simply solve it. That one's really straightforward if you actually get one of those. All right. Um, the other one on the apps, or no, I don't want to do apps, I want to do stats. On the t-test, okay. This is the t-test. This is our one on the stats. Let me go back there again. T-test and chi-squared. You're going to go to stats, and that's where you'll find all your tests. We do the t-test, and we do, um, sorry, the two-sample t-test. What's the difference? Let me go back here, stats. T-test, a lot of you are probably trying to go here today. 
The reason you know it's not the t-test is we just have this L1 right here, and we were inputting double things. We were doing L1 and L2. If you were trying to do that t-test earlier on the test, it didn't give you an L2, and you were putting in an L1 and an L2. That's how you know you were in the wrong test. We were doing two samples. We had two different types of samples on there. We had sample one, mean one, and we had sample two, mean two. We were comparing two different samples, which is how we did a two sample t-test. All right, we had data. We had L1 and L2. We just leave the frequencies at one and two. And then you have to hear this alternative. This is H or M1 or H1. Is, I think this was supposed to be an H1. It's supposed to be the alternative. So we're going to look here and we're going to say, how are we looking at M1 and M2? How are they related? And we said that M1 was not equal to M2, was what we were looking at our um, alternative on that one, I believe is what it was looking at. And so we said the alternative was that they were not equal. So on that particular one, we went here and we said it was not equal. Then you were looking down here and you're like, pooled, what does pooled mean? And we went with, it's always pooled. Every time we do any kind of statistics, we always say that it's pooled. That just means it comes from the same criteria. Like if we were sampling people that were um, born in Texas, we might say pooled meaning we only sampled people that were from the USA. We didn't sample people from the USA, from Europe, from Canada, from Mexico. We didn't sample that. That would be non-pooled. Pooled meaning we only sampled people that were born in the United States and we asked those people, were you born in Texas? Okay, that's a pooled set of data. We pooled people that were born in, in the United States and said, were you born in Texas? Okay, non-pooled would be, we just asked anybody in the world, were you born in Texas? And that's like not pooled data. Okay, two sampled. Okay, uh, stats, test. Now we also have things like our, as we go down, we have our chi-squared. Okay, chi-squared test. And you're like, well, what am I supposed to do on that? Well, chi-squared, chi-squared goodness of fit. That's where those buttons are. All right, chi-squared, you have the funny little things there. Those are matrices. So remember, in order to do those, you're going to have to go down here and you're going to have to use your matrices. So you're going to have to do second matrix and you're going to have to go in here just follow your buttons. They're going to help you where to go. So you'll go over to edit and you'll have to put your matrix in. So this right here is a three by three. So as you go to put that in, if you need a three by two, you can just change it and do three by two. And if that's not the way you need it, so this is three this way by two this way. If you're like, oh wait, I need it to go the other way, two by three, then change it and do it that way. Okay. Then what you do after you put it all in, you go to stat, test, and go back down to your chi-squared. And A is here. But then you're like, well, where's B? I never put B in. Your calculator automatically does B. So you don't have to. Oh, division by zero. That's because my chi-squared, I, I had that in there. Okay, so let me go to matrix. I'm going to go back to edit. Let me throw some numbers in there. I'll put in two and I'll put in three. Okay, so stat test. Okay, so there we go. So it calculated it. Now, degrees of freedom, remember you do the row minus one times the column minus one. So it, it also will do that for you. You won't have to do that. Then you also have your chi squared goodness of fit. Remember the goodness of fit, that's where you're deciding. Usually you have something like a, um, oh, what was that one? Where we had like um, an expected outcome, like maybe you had seven days in a week and you um, wanted to see like uh, something was distributed um, equally across, like you anticipated that calls were um, uniformly distributed and like you expected 25 calls would come in every day. And so you wanted to see, like, did that really happen? And so what was the expected number of calls every day? Well, you would expect 25 calls. So when you go into stat and you put this in, and here, let's say I'm just going to use this L1 is what my my calls were, whatever, whatever the data is I'm trying to collect. 
but let's say that I actually thought it was supposed to be five. That was what I expected. Then I would have this other column over here and they would all be the same. Okay, so I would put them all there as the same. I need to delete that. So when you do goodness of fit, it's going to look something like this where you have all your values here. But over here, they're going to all be exactly the same because it's a goodness of fit. Does the data fit what you expect? Then you go to stat and you go back to your test and then you go down to your goodness of fit and you're like, well, wait, the other one was matrices. That's okay because watch what happens. Goodness of fit. Look at that. L1 and L2. Your chi-squared goodness of fit tells you what you're supposed to have. All right. Degrees of freedom. You would have to fix that part. The degrees of freedom. You count the rows and subtract one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I have ten. Subtract one. There'd be nine degrees of freedom. Remember, degrees of freedom are simply this. If each of these had a choice of a candy bar, this guy would pick one, this guy would pick one, he'd pick, everybody would have the freedom to pick whatever they want, except for the last guy, he doesn't get to pick, he gets what's left, he doesn't have a degree of freedom, whatever's left is what he gets, so there's nine degrees of freedom, and the last guy gets whatever is left, he, he has no choice, so I'm going to go here, I'm going to say yes, yes, I'm going to say there's nine degrees of freedom, oh, uh, okay, so, oh, am I in radians? I'm in degrees. I do not know why it's saying I needed to be in radians. I don't need to be in radians. Okay. Um, high square goodness of fit. Oh, value entered is not allowed in the function or command. Oh, do I have something in here in radians? So I can quit. Stat. Oh, wait. Oh, let me clear that out. Stat. Calculate. I must have had something in there I didn't like. Nope, still not liking it. Uh, da, da, da. This is where you do second plus seven one two, and you reset your calculator. I'm gonna bump the stat. Get it. Make sure I don't have a radiance in there. I don't think I have a radiance in there. Okay, let, we're just gonna change these numbers. Three, five, six, two, five, two, one, two, eight, four. Okay, let's see if we're working now. There we go. I just needed to change the numbers. I guess I must have had some radians in there before from what I was using. Okay, so there it goes, and it gives me that. And so my chi-squared, my p-value. And again, if the p is low, the whole must go. So we reject the null if the p is low. This situation, the p is not low, so I would not reject the null. Okay, let's see. What else do we have? We did two sample t-test. We did chi-squared. We did chi-squared goodness of fit. Um, I think that's all of them. I feel like I hit them all. I know that was really fast. We did apps. We did finance. Oh, no, we didn't do the distributions. Whew. Okay. Second, over here, you've got distribution. We're going to hit that. Okay. We don't ever use number one. We do number two, normal CDF. All right. So let me grab my board. Oh, my gosh, if you're still with me. Some of you may be, like, zoned out now because you're like, I can't take it anymore. I'm just, I'm done. I'm going to crash on my test. I, I can't I can't take it anymore, Mrs. Dean. I'm I'm done with the test. You're good. You're good. You're still hanging in there. Okay, here's the last little bit. Normal CDF and the binomial PDF. Okay. So crash course on this. Okay, so normal. Okay. We're gonna talk about the normal CDF. So this is the CDF. Whoop, there it is. Okay, so this is the normal. CDF. Okay, we don't do the PDF at all. Normal CDF, that's where you have the mean. Remember the normal CDF, that's just where you have a normal distribution, and the normal distribution is always the area under the curve, and it's talking about a uh, probability. Underneath the curve is the area under the curve, and the area under the curve is the probability. And so typically when you have a normal CDF, you are talking about what's the air, what's the probability that some number is maybe what's the probability that uh, maybe this is 20 right here and we'll say this is 30 what's the probability that x is less than or equal to 20 okay 
And so they want to know what's this area under the curve. And so you would simply do a normal CDF. And so we'll say that the mean is 30, and you would know that the standard deviation is maybe 2.5. That's what it would give you. And so you would do a normal CDF. I'm going to say it wants to know what's the lowest it goes. Well, this is negative infinity out here. So I'm going to leave it at negative 1 e to the 99. I'm going to leave that. The upper boundary is right here at 20. So I do 20. And then the mean up here is this 30 right here. That's my mean. The standard deviation is 2.5. And then it tells me the probability is 3.168. Now, that, remember, that's the probability that it's under the curve. Now, that did not work because probability cannot be what? can't be bigger than 1, can it? So I need to redo that. And it could have been because I made it up. So let me quit that. Let me try that one more time. Because probabilities cannot be bigger than 1. So I need to make sure that I got the upper boundary is 20. The mean is 30. Standard deviation is 2.5. Oh, I'm sorry. E times 10 e to the negative 5. So that means it's 3, 1, 6, 8. I'm going to move this over. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So the probability is pretty low, right? That is very, very low. So how would I want to write this? Never write it with E. I would write it like this. Times 10 to the negative 5. That's the probability. That They're not going to give me one like that because that's a goofy one that I made up. Okay. So the other option that they will do on here after the normal CDF is sometimes they give you a scenario like this. And we'll do that 30 again. But this time I give you that... A num some number x is, um, maybe I'll say it's uh, 20, the area is 25% chance that it's less than 30. You know, there's 25%. And so this time you know that the area under the curve is 25%, and you want to know what's the value that that happens at. And so you know the area under the curve. So you do the distribution. And you look at this and you're like, oh, that's the inverse norm because I know the area under the curve. So when you do the area, you have to change it to a decimal. So 0.25. So now you know the probability, 0.25. We know the mean is 30. We know the standard deviation. I think we'll just say it's like 3.5. I don't remember what we said. Left, center, and right. I'm on the left-hand side of the mean, right? I'm on the left-hand side. I'm going to leave that there, and I'm going to say paste. And it says the answer for this is 27.6. That's the number value on the left-hand side, and I am on the left-hand side of that. Now, what if I would wanted to do this? If I wanted to say that there's some number spread, maybe it's like this. Here's my, I'll put this as 45. There's a number here and a number here such that this encompasses 68%, and I want to know what are these two numbers. Well, here's what we know. We know the area, so we do the inverse norm, second inverse norm, because I know the area. I do 0 0.68. My mean is 45. Let's say the standard deviation on this one is 6.8. I'll do 6.8. But this time, I'm in the middle. I want these two numbers right here. I simply go here. I hit enter. I'm in the center. I need two values. Watch what this does. It gives me this number over here is 38.2. This number over here is 51.8. It gives me both those two numbers. So that's how the inverse norm CDF works. Now, the complement to that is going to be... Those are our two types of distributions. So if we have a binomial, bi means two. That means you're going to have two options. Normal distribution is a group, uh, the statistics is normally distributed, and you have a mean. A binomial distribution means you get two scenarios, binomial PDF and a binomial CDF. A bi means two. You have two options. You either pass it or you fail it. You flip a coin and you get heads or you get tails. Okay? 
You walk in the door or out the door. So you pick A or B on a test. So binomial means there's two probabilities that can happen, right? There's this or that. That's the only way you can, you can have a binomial distribution. So second distribution, we're going to scroll down and we're going to see binomial PDF and CDF. Now, PDF, that is the probability that I get exactly some number, exactly two, exactly three. The CDF, that's the probability that I get something greater than or equal to some number. Now, you have to remember this next part, and this is like the worst part about our calculators, and I apologize. This one right here is super easy. The probability that you roll a dice and you get exactly three. The probability that you're shooting a target and you land in the center exactly three times. But the CDF, that's the tough one. This is the probability that I'm rolling a dice. Um, the pro we'll, we'll just put a dice up here. One, two, three, four. What's the probability that I roll a four? Well, the probability that I roll a four would be one in six, right? Dice is six-sided. Six What's the probability that I roll this dice 20 times? I'm going to roll this dice 20 times. What's the probability that in that 20 times that I roll it, that I roll a four more than 10 times? I want to roll a four, roll a four more than 10 times. Here's what my calculator says. Well, I don't know how to do that, but here's what it does. I could roll it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, on and on and on, 18, 19, 20. Now, here is what my beloved calculator sees. I could roll it 10 or more here. Let me put this. I should do it this way. I forgot I put 10. 9, 10, 11, 12, on and on and on, 18, 19, 20. Okay, my calculator says, I want to know the probability that I roll it 10 or more times, right? I want to know the probability of this. What that means is 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 13, all the way up, to 20 times. I need to add all those probabilities together. But my calculator can't do that. But what my calculator can do is it could add these because it reads from the left to the right. It can add 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 9. It could add those because it reads from the left all the way to the right. It can do that. And when it gets that number, I can say 1 minus that number and get the answer. So here we go. We're going to do this. So I'm going to do a binomial CDF. PDF is precisely that number. CDF is cumulative. We're going to roll this dice 20 times. The probability you roll a 4 is 1 over 6. I want to know the probability that I roll, I can't do 10 or more, so I have to do 9. I can do 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way to 9. And when I put a binomial CDF, that's what that says, 9. When I put that 9 there, it's 0 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. Okay. The probability is 0 point nine 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 nine. The probability that I roll the number 4 9 times is really high. Like, really high. So what I need to do is say 1 minus that big old number, the probability that I roll a 4 10 or more times is 5.985 times 10 to the negative 4. It's not a very big number. It is not a very big it, The likelihood is not very high. Not very high at all. Okay, binomial PDF and CDF. There we go. All right, y'all. I am pretty certain that that is all the buttons that you need to know. Um, y equal. Oh, you know what? I didn't do the calculus buttons. Let me do those. Y equals. Let's put um, 5x to the fourth. 
minus 8x, uh, we'll put cubed, and then we'll put minus 2x. Okay, we'll graph it. Oh, I may need to, Ooh, let's change that window. Let's do zoom uh, 9 for zoom stat. Okay, there we go. Now remember, I've got it all in there. I can go to second calculate. I can cal calculate a value. I can go enter. I'm going to calculate y equals 8. And it calculates y equals 8 is that right there. I could also do second calculate. I could go down and calculate the derivative. I hit enter and it calculates, hit it twice, it calculates the derivative. Okay, it did that. Okay, I can also go back here and graph it. I can calculate, I can go down. Now, if I put an integral in there, here's what it wants. Let me show you on this. If I'm going to tell it to calculate a derivative, or not a derivative, but an integral, I need to tell it what the boundaries are. So I need to tell it, if I'm going to calculate the derivative of f of x dx, I need to tell it where I'm going to go. So maybe I'm going to go from 2 to 4. Okay, so I need to tell it what the boundaries are. So it's asking for the lower limit. That's the bottom. I'm going to say 2. And the upper limit, I'm going to say 4. I don't know if that will work because I may not have it. Oh, I do. It colors it. It tells me the limit is 500. So that's the area under the curve. Okay, so remember you can always use that. Um, and for your calculus, that's about all you're going to have to use. Um, if you do the trapezoidal rule, you'll do part of it, and then you'll come back and do this. This is the exact area. So this would be um, when you do your um, error analysis, that would be your exact. Or your percentage error, this would be the exact. All right, I think that was everything. All right, I'm going to post this. Thank you all for watching.